of the old guys I knew in North Carolina, when I asked them, look, men born between 1900 and 1930, when you were when you were a kid, what was your first instrument? And nine out of ten of them said they played a cigar box guitar. Now, you know how when you say something to a dog and he doesn't understand you, he goes like this? <laughs> like, I did what? You know. Uh, but it's a one-string instrument, usually made with a broomstick and the wire off the bottom of the broom, which is the best string on the farm. But you have to tear up a store-bought broom to get to that. And one of my oldest friends, born in 1900, said his mother came home from the field one day and found a pile of broomstick in the front yard and him wanging on this thing in the backyard and grabbed a piece of kindling and came around the corner. <laughs> and said, you tore up my store, I had to pay money for that broom. I ain't gonna beat you on those pants. I had to pay money for them too. Get them out of my way! <laughs> so the first time he played an instrument like this, it hurt a lot. But she wasn't gonna beat him every time he picked it up, so he figured it was, you know, skin in the game. It was a good, <laughs> good investment. You know. But the old men had only one string instrument, sometimes with a wire out of a screen door. They'd clip, clip it here and clip it there. Your mother beat you for that too because the one more mosquito is going to get in the house because you took the wire and then fish it out and then use that. But the broom wire was the best because it, it was reasonably straight, could be straight. This is a guitar string and a guitar peg. Instead of a broomstick, I used a pool cue. Ah. So I take this thing apart. I, this goes to Europe when I go. This, when I fly, this goes in a suitcase. And I may only play one song in it as I will tonight. I think only one probably, but... There's something so elemental about removing everything else and leaving two hands, one string, on an instrument made of junk and still a vehicle for the human spirit. This is a victory of black people in this country making something out of nothing. Yep. And it's something that I really love. So uh, here we go. Two rhythms, one in one hand and one in the other. Set up a drone and a groove. Don't be shy, come in and find a seat. Second rhythm. Two at once. One. I won't. <laughs> you know, in the beginning, God created the groove. She thought it was good, and she rested. It's the rhythm method. This is like, yeah, it's it. So. Judge, give me life this morning down on Parchment Farm. Judge, give me life this morning down on Parchment Farm. Someday that I will 
someone will start to sing and then they're going to go around the pub among whoever's still standing and if you don't have a, a song or a limerick or a joke or some short story or something to do you're you know you're you're in trouble <laughs> so all my Scottish friends Frankie McGuire included say oh that's a really good party trick <laughs> but these go by a lot of names across the Black South. They're called jitterbugs in Mississippi, probably named after the dance, not the other way around. A pictar, like a guitar, the southern pronunciation, a guitar, a pictar. Um, I had a black woman in Columbus, Mississippi, maybe 20 years ago, when I was working there, come up to me after a show and say, I had one of those when I was a kid. She was about this high and about that wide. I said, what'd you call it? She said, we just called it music. <laughs> but in Georgia they go by a very special name. They're called diddly bow. Say diddly bow. Say diddly -bow. Diddly -bow. Like having a carbonated drink in your mouth. Diddly bow. It's so fun to say. Percussive. And they think the name comes out of Africa. I have no idea. But when you turn those two words around you get Diddly. 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 who took his rock and roll stage name, the shape of his custom made electric guitar, and the rhythms that he and Chuck Berry were playing come off instruments like this and were danced to in the black community out of white hearing for hundreds of years before they turned into rock and roll. Thank you. That's, That's enough of that. Now, Coles to Newcastle, I couldn't come to West Virginia without bringing a banjo. So, um, this is a little gourd banjo, fretless gourd banjo. The way Africans make strings louder is they, they dry a gourd in the sun and stretch a, a, a drum head over it and put a stick all the way through it. And they're called stick lutes. And, uh, the Akanting is a three-string version of this instrument. Um, the American banjo during, you know, before the Civil War was a four-string instrument, three strings to fret and a drone string always. And the four-string was added sometime in the late uh, 19th century, I'm not sure when. But people say they added the four-string of the banjo, they're not talking about what we call the four-string, it was this one. <laughs> Tuning from Sherman Ammons. This is the tuning he uses for playing Sugar Baby. It's the only song I knew that he played in this tuning. I never heard him play anything else. And, and he's the only person I know who played in a tuning like this. Um, and I've been asking people for 40 years. Um, and I have yet to run across this thing like except Bob Carlin made one up. Which is very much like this. But these are four of the five notes of the minor pentatonic scale out of West Africa. That's a weird banjo tuning. You know, it doesn't it doesn't give us a chord. And this is what this is what I learned from Sherman. I'll play a couple more on this. <laughs> uh, skinhead, nylon strings, no frets. It can be hard to get this banjo in tune, but you know, being in tune is overrated. <laughs> And if you ever got a banjo perfectly in tune, it would sound like a guitar. Baby. 
this tuning uh, since I was 18, but I, I'd never figure out what the notes were. I just knew how to get there and how to get back from another standard banjo tuning. And when this banjo came in the house, uh, I, I thought, boy, that sounds African to me. You know, it's the right timbre. It's this thing. And I thought, what are those notes? And I've been playing blues for 25, 30 years by then, and blues are essentially African melodies with European chords that use this minor pentatonic scale. And all the early spirituals were also sung in this African scale. So I thought, can we take a spiritual, an early spiritual, and move it onto this instrument? How close can we get with that? And it turns out, I only have to fret one note to get the fifth, you know, the, the second note of this five note scale. All the rest of them are on open strings. So this is a tuning. Designed to make playing African melodies easy. And here's one, right? Graceland fans, any? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Mississippi Delta shining like a national guitar? <laughs> he wasn't writing about this one, but he was writing about these. These were marketed and sold as Hawaiian guitars uh, when, mm -hmm. when uh, portable recording gear became possible. Rather than bringing Hawaiians to the mainland, they took gear to Hawaii. They came back with slide guitar and slack key guitar players. And it went right, slide guitar went right straight into country music. Um, and there were people in the blues community years ago who used to say, well, black people learned how to play slide guitar from Hawaiian music. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. This was before the idiocy of the internet. Um, but now you can find it everywhere. Um, but these guitars were built with an aluminum speaker inside of an amplifier. And they're, it's going to be loud. Um, and it's sort of a pre-electric guitar to give you a sense of the science behind these guitars. Just we take a, a key and tap on the outside of the guitar, it's that loud. 
We tap on the aluminum speaker inside the guitar. The strings are resting on the bridge there. <laughs> I can hit it. There it is. So it's like, whoa. And these things were unbelievably loud in a very quiet world. <laughs> With no refrigerator running, no engines, horses and mules, chickens out back. You could hear one of these guitars a mile away. If somebody's playing one of these, you could hear it. And you'd go. <laughs> because most of the sound comes out of a speaker, it sounds a little bit like electric guitars. When you've got a good friend When you've got a good friend that will stay right by your side, give her all your spare time. She sympathized with me. six years uh, transcribing all of Robert Johnson's recordings a spare decade. And, and, and published a book. It took, it took seven years. Um, uh, it's out of print now. Robert didn't sell his uh, soul at the crossroads, but I'm pretty sure he gave his, his publishing rights. Um, the book cost me $10,000 in legal fees before the first copy was printed. I mean, it was just, it was just a nightmare, and every time I've tried to re- up that book, it's just, it cost me years of, of frustration, bought me nothing. So I finally just gave up. It's available on Amazon now. I have 
I have a DVD on how to play this stuff that I made in 1997. You see the younger, cuter. This is like 40 pounds ago. Um, but um, it taught me a lot. And what's interesting about getting that close to somebody's guitar playing is you put your hands where their hands were. And it gives you a, a perspective. And the closer I got to Robert's guitar parts, the more crazy and cool they were. You know, there's some paintings you look at and say, it looks great from 20 yards away, and the closer you get, the worse it is. You know, the brushwork isn't there. The you know, so It's meant to be seen from a distance, but not up close. With Robert's stuff, the closer I got, the more astonished I was at the detail and the care that went into these guitar parts. Um, come back to Robert. When I was 15, I went to a concert that Mike Seeger was giving. Um, Mike was, I don't know, 31 or something, and I was 1967. And uh, he, might, he might have been in his early 20s, mid-20s, but anyway, he was at a local high school, and I went, and the folk club was putting on, you know, so I was, I was in a folk music, okay. I played everything I get my hands on from the age of three forward. I was playing flute at the time in the elementary and middle school bands. Um, and the, the freshman year of high school, but I walked into this. I was unhappy with my band director. He was a, he was an asshole. <laughs> Can I say that out loud? Um, Not loud enough. You want to know his name? Uh, but anyway, he, you know, he he was a grasping. Uh, he lusted after the marching band at Indiana State. And he didn't want to teach high school kids how to play music, so he was a real prick. And uh, um, and I, I'll give you his name if you want. But uh, let's call, on. I mean, I you know. I, let's call him up. He probably let's call him up. <laughs> But God bless him, because if he hadn't been such a jerk, I might still play in a band, you know, in a, you know, a, a wind instrument. Marching um, clarinet, man, that could be you. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is it's very hard to sing and play a wind instrument at the same time. But I, I went and, and, and Seeger played, seven, there were 17 instruments scattered all over the stage. He'd get up and pick another one up. Pan pipes, you know, I mean, you name it. He had, and all the Appalachians. And I loved that. I was, and about halfway through the concert, the back door of the auditorium, this you know, five or six hundred seat auditorium with 150 people in it. Sitting down front, the back door opens, we hear the back door open, and Mike looks up, and he sees a, a black man come through the door with a guitar case and a fe fedora on. Uh. It's John Jackson. Uh. <laughs> he says, John, come on down here. And then he turns to us, he says, you need to hear this man play. John, play these people a couple of songs. And he gave up his chair in the middle of his concert to this black grave digger. And John gets up. And he does some of the guitar I hadn't imagined. I mean, I was paying attention in the, night, the, in this, in the mid 60s to what acoustic guitars did essentially one of two things. They either played like Phil Oaks and. Um, Woody Guthrie and, you know, Bob Dylan. You know, it's a, not subtle, but it's effective guitar playing. And the other pole was the Peter, Paul, and Mary subtle, but not particularly effective. Um, <laughs> my horses ain't hungry. They won't eat your hay. So as John was ascending to the stage in coveralls, he was a grave digger. He had the mud from somebody's grave on the corner of his boots, but he put on a clean shirt. Um, and he's ascending the stage. I'm thinking he's going to do one of those two things. And I'm sure, pretty sure he had hands the size of frying pans. I was pretty sure he wasn't going to do this. So I was betting on that, you know, crash and burn stuff. He did something with the guitar I couldn't have imagined. And I walked in there curious about guitar and folk music, and I walked out a guitar player who essentially never touched the instrument. I started playing guitar six weeks later at Boy Scout camp. I was lucky to be a, a lifeguard. <laughs> so, breakfast at 7.30, clean up, couldn't open the, you know, couldn't open the waterfront until 10. Right. <laughs> 10 to 12, 12, shut down, lunch. Couldn't open until 2, 5 o'clock, shut down, done. I was working five hours a day. <laughs> And there was a guitar in a case where we had our meals, where the staff had their meals. And I looked at it, a cardboard case, black, you know, black 
cardboard case back, you know, what these were like, and a little Yamaha or something, six string. I, I looked at it and I said, whose guitar is that? And they said, that's Vic, he's in the kitchen, work in the kitchen. So I tucked my head in the kitchen, and Vic, who was a, a Mormon who's off the reservation, <laughs> and, and was the wildest kid on camp. I mean, you know, like, you know, uh, and, but I, I said, Vic, he says, yeah, yeah, what? Because he was busy all the time. I said, is this your guitar? Says, yeah, yeah, it's mine. Could, would you mind if I looked at it? He says, anytime you want. I'm going to, I'm here at 4.30 in the morning. I've got uh, lunch, dishes, you know, uh, dishes, dinner, dishes, fall down dead. I'm not going to play that thing. <laughs> Take it anywhere you want. If it's not here, I'll know you've got it. It's okay. <laughs> play it as much as you want. So there was a book with Peter, Paul, and Mary songs in it, which is where I, <laughs> where I learned this. I knew the sound, I, 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 but the chord, little pictures of the chords were above the words. It's like, oh yeah, you know. So I was playing guitar four and five hours a day, every single day, uh, for ten or twelve weeks. And by the end of the summer, man, I could play. I mean, I had a repertoire. It's small, and I'm a better player now. It's been fifty. It's been a long, long time. <laughs> But John set me on this path, and John played guitar not like, or, but like this. Coast, a white blues player, and I told this story from the stage, and he came to me at lunch the next day and said, you know, I was in that room. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I was sitting, I was sitting in the back, and I, I started playing guitar a month later. I was <laughs> That's two! <laughs> John and I were friends, he died in 2002, we were friends from then, you know, basically until now. He was a, a very, very sweet man, like a black Buddha, he was one of the kindest men. And not the only really kind man, old black man I knew. And these men grew up in the Jim Crow South, where if you copped an attitude or decided you had rights, you could get killed. But to ascribe the work they did to become kind and forgiving human beings mm -hmm. to expedience yeah. is an assault mm -hmm. on their character. They did this because, not just because they had to, but because they chose to.
Yep. And that's something to be. Right. A guy named Willie Malloy, who was born in 1900. I met him in 1988. He was still playing electric guitar with his church quartet. Played almost everything in drop D. He didn't care about the harmony. He just got the melody note he wanted. And <laughs> got weird. Um, Tell you a quick story. Willie ran away from home when he was 15 with a blues band. This was 1915. The zenith of lynchings in this country was in 1919, 1920. Willie was roaming around the country as a 15, 16, 17 year old for two years on the road. And he wound up in Charleston, West Virginia, playing on the black side of town. And uh, he played Friday night with the band and, and, uh, and slept under a table with his guitar arms around his guitar so nobody would steal it from him. And he woke up in the morning about 10 o'clock and he wandered out into the sunlight, you know, looking for breakfast and a cup of coffee. And a, a church lady accosted him. Willie told me this story when I first met him. He said, she said, you the one making that racket last night? That's how he said it. <laughs> he said, yes, ma'am. Going to do it again tonight, too. <laughs> she said, well, if you can play for the devil, you can play for the Lord. You come to my church tomorrow morning. She said, I'm going to be up. I'm going to be up most of the night. She said, stay up. <laughs> I said, well, maybe I will. Where, which church is yours? Hoping to get out of this and go get some coffee. And she said, you'd walk him two steps out. He could tell you the name of the street corner he was on. He told me the names of the streets. <laughs> he said, down, you know, about three blocks down, that one, on the right, 10 o'clock, and bring that box with you, but we don't want to hear no blues. So Willie was up most of the night, um, and he started thinking about the collection plate. <laughs> and he thought, this could work, this could work. <laughs> so he decided to stay up and go to church. And he went into church, and he played his mother's favorite hymn, favorite song, which I'm about to play for you, the way Willie played it for me. And, uh, you know, he missed her so much, he, he decided he wanted to go home. He quit the band. You know, 16 and a half, 17, started walking home, because nobody's, nobody's hitchhiking. He's walking from Charleston, West Virginia, to Fayetteville, North Carolina. <laughs> and he got, he, got, he got some kind of a ride into Virginia, and um, he told me it was Norfolk, Virginia, and he got, ran out of money there, so he took a job in a reconditioned furniture store where he would They'd knock old dresser drawers apart and re-glue them and put, you know, strip them down and put a coat of paint on them and resell them, recondition furniture. And Willie's job, there's six guys in the back working with the, with the fumes and tools and refinishing and stuff, and Willie's job was to put it in the window, put a sign on it, and sell it. So Willie was out front one day, and what he told me, you see, when I met, when I met Willie, he didn't have eyelids. He didn't have a nose. And the tops of his ears were gone. He'd been third degree burned, his, way up into the top of his head. His, his face had been melted off of him. And he had a goiter about the size of a, gall, a, a tennis ball right here, too, which nobody had ever treated. But he was a mess. And I asked him, as one does, Willie, what happened to your face? Because when something's obvious, you don't want to ignore it. It's an insult. So after we'd spend a little time, I guess, Willie, what happened? He said, well, I told me this story. He said, I heard the explosion. And six men in the back room died right in. And I turned around, I saw the fireball coming through the door, and I started running for the front door, but it caught up with me, and he did this, and it burned off my, my eyelids and my, my, and my nose and the tops of my ears. He did that with his hands, and then he said, and it blew me out through the door out into the street. He said, I wouldn't be here talking to you today, but some man grabbed me by my clothes and pulled me out away from that brick storefront. It fell down right where I had been lying. And I, I don't know who that man was. And I've never been able to thank him. <laughs> so six weeks in the hospital, social workers are coming by saying, hey, Willie can't, he can't close his eyes. He's going blind. And the social worker said, Willie, where are your people? He said, Fayetteville, North Carolina. He says, you have to go. You don't want to go blind in a town where nobody knows who nobody cares about you. You need to go find your people. 
they gave him bus fare when he got out, and he got on a bus, and got out in Fayetteville, and started looking for his family. But in those days, when you couldn't make the rent, you ran away in the middle of the night and took up somewhere else. And so the family moved a couple times on the black side of Fayetteville. And Willie couldn't find him, and he's losing his sight every single day. He's there for three days, drinking out of the puddles in the ditches, and sleeping with the bottles of moonshine hidden under the brambles in the back of houses in the black neighborhood, trying to find, asking for his parents. And nobody recognizes him because his face has been burned off. Right. So, well, I don't know, they used to live here, but they might, may, might, maybe, and he finally knocks on a door about three days into this, and his mother opens the door, and he is so relieved to see her. But she is facing this horribly disfigured young man, and it says, Mama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she, she threw her arms around him, brought him in the house, Settled him down, gave him something to eat, put him in bed. And Willie said, I wake up the next morning stone blind. My mother's face was the last face I, I saw. Whoa. And this is a song that led him home. I went by Willie's house in 19... I, I knew him well from 1980 to 1990. You saw him every couple of weeks go by the house play music. And, uh, really like to preach and carry on. I've got some tapes. But um, when I went by in 1995, he was gone. The you know, horse house boarded up, and I, I just missed his exit. But he, when he sang this song, you believed every word.
Loman? <laughs> Willie Loman? Willie Malo uh, Malloy. Malloy. You will. You won't find him. <laughs> you did. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, when I got to Fayetteville Tech, I was an artist in residence at the college. I did my introductory, you know, thing for the faculty members. I had an English professor. I think his name was John Thomas. Go with me afterwards and say, man, I don't remember his name. I remember Willie's name. He said, I got a man renting one of my houses across town. I think you'd like to meet. Black side of town, across town. He was born in 1900, plays guitar. I said, you're absolutely right. I want to meet him. When do we go? <laughs> so that's, that's when I met Willie. Last member of the band, uh, this is a Froggy Bottom guitar um, that I built with Michael Millard at Froggy Bottom mm -hmm. six years, going on seven years ago now. And, and uh, this guitar is proof that Michael Millard could teach a chimpanzee to build <laughs> a world class instrument. I, I've been turning Michael down. He's been, we were friends for a long time before we did this. And he kept saying, you know, we should build a guitar together someday. I said, Michael, I'm a bad house carpenter. You don't want me anywhere near these things. <laughs> he said, we could do it, you know. I said, no, and I just, out of hand, no, 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 and then one day, I played a guitar very much like this one for a friend, David Surrett, who had uh, been diagnosed with cancer and was really, his family was really in trouble, and Michael went right out to the shop and bought, you know, got this fancy wood, and we, and we auctioned off a guitar to, to give to David and raised $33,000. Wow. And somebody walked away with that guitar for like a hundred bucks, you know what I mean, but, yeah. um, but it was, uh, after that I, I turned to Michael and said, you know, Michael, if I was going to build one of your guitars, I, I would build one, like, you know, like the one that you built for David. And he looked at me like a nine-year-old on Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. He said, can you give me four or five weeks in a row? Mm -hmm. I said, well, maybe if we started in August and early, yeah, I think, I think so. He said, let's go choose some wood. <laughs> so he, he picked the most valuable wood he had in the shop and beautiful as uh, stump cut Brazilian rosewood. It's, it's, it's stumps of trees that were harvested in the 1970s. The stumps were dug up resinous wood in the rainforest and rendered into guitar wood 20 years later in the 1990s. And in 2000, whatever, Michael gave me that. I said, Michael, you can't give me this. He said, when I die, the other guys in the shop are going to get all this wood. You're my best, one of my best friends. Well, I can't give you some. But it terrified me, because if a chisel got away from me, I'd be making a ukulele. <laughs> I mean, this is irreplaceable wood. <laughs> anyway. I'm in open C tuning, if you're curious. If you're not curious, I'm still in open C tuning. <laughs> My wife and I play with language a lot. Actually, we were in Berkeley Springs this afternoon for a little while, and, we, and I, I, I said, you know, there's a place here where you can watch battery replacements. What? You can watch battery replacements. What? You can just go in. There's a sign on the side of the room. Watch. Watch battery replacements. <laughs> The English language is a mess, you know. But I know that sign. As, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, you just watch battery replacement. Um, but Barb and I are fond of saying, uh, not about each other, of course, but it's always better to be married to a smart ass than a dumbass. <laughs> and there only seem to be two options. So. So this is a tune from Florida, from the, the turpentine camps in South Georgia and Florida where uh, blacks would be ling lured away from their homes for the promise of a dollar or a dollar and a half a day to render pine bark into turpentine and then when all the barrels were full six or eight weeks later they'd drag you back into town and you were supposed to get paid. <laughs> the families who ran these, con the, these concessions for years in these camps um, were very proud, white families of course, that they didn't pay wages because they fed the crew. They were sleeping on their cots, in their tents. They couldn't just give that away. So they withhold nearly all, if not all, of your pay for room and board. And feel justified in doing it. So six or eight weeks later, you go home, they've got the turpentine, you got nothing, and can't testify in court, can't bring charges, not uh, without risking your life. And so... Uh, 
Emmett Murray did this, and he came out of the camp in the in the in the twenties or thirties, and came out of the camps with this song, which is as much about sharecropping as it is about uh, turpentine. But it's an astonishing document in America, and I was captivated by it when I heard it. And it's a title cut for one of my records called "You Better Lie Down." You all, you old long-time rounders, you know the term rounder? Railroad camp. A rounder is a guy who will kill you not for cheating at cards, but for winning. <laughs> These are, and quick with a razor, quick with a gun, tough characters. And in this song, they're warned that they've met their match. All you old long-time rounders, you better lie down. You better back off. You better, that's the chorus. Nothing but the stars and moon. All of you old long time rounders, you lie down. You die late, but you get up soon. You see nothing but the stars and the moon. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Never would have left St. Augustine. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Might be crazy, but I ain't no fool. I'm going back to Florida where I don't have to plow. No mules. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Mighty cloudy, but it ain't gonna rain. Look on the table, it's the same old thing. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Better lie down. Streak of lean, strong cup of coffee, but ain't no sugar been seen. All of you old long time rounders, you better lie down. Captain got away, he got to stop. Waking me up at four o'clock. All of you set list so it just sort of follow my nose and there's there's never going to be enough time to play all the music I want to play so I just keep on going see what yeah. happens see what happens um, David Honeyboy Edwards uh, was a, a, a music festival pal of mine David was at the gig when Robert Johnson was poisoned he was born around 1918 I think he was a little younger than Robert but he liked to play slide guitar, but he didn't like to retune the guitar. It was a pain uh, to put it in a different key, and then somebody else would go play something else, and you'd be in the wrong key. So he liked to play slide and standard tuning, which solo slide and standard tuning is kind of a trick, because there's a whole bunch of notes you don't want to hear. Um, but I ran up on Honey Boy in, in, uh, in the Baltimore airport with, with Barb. We were, we were traveling, and, and 
he's walking around, you know. I, that's Honey Wayward's. We need to go say hello. And so we, we cross, you know, the, the, the wide aisle of people going this way and that. And say, hey, Honey Boy. It's Scott. We met up at the Upper Mississippi. We said, hey, man, good to see you. Good to see you. He knew who I was. <laughs> but you don't get a nickname like Honey Boy for nothing. He was a nice guy. You you know me? Cool. What should we do? You know, and I said, Honey Boy, what are you doing here? Do you, you have a gig? He said, no, man, no gig. He's about 90, 90 years old, probably. I said, um, do you have family here? He said, no, the ones that ain't dead are in Chicago. I said, well, um, you go to museums? He said, no, man, no museum. I said, what are you doing here? He said, they gave me this. And he takes the brown craft wrapper, wrapping paper off of a, a picture frame. And he's holding the Kennedy Center Lifetime Achievement Award, <laughs> which came with like a check for 25 grand. And he didn't want to check it, so he was just carrying it around. <laughs> When anybody was 95, Barb heard him on the radio and told me the story. I'm going to retell it, but he's being interviewed by uh, an NPR personality, a young white woman, clearly, who has not hung out with old black men. <laughs> Nor is she very good at her job, because she says, I'm here in the studio with David Honeyboy Edwards. What a sweet nickname, Honeyboy. Yep. That's a lot of dead air on public radio. You don't ask yes or no questions unless you're a prosecutor. She says, and you're 95 years old. And he goes, yep. yep. <laughs> Three times a charm, right? And she said, and you, you still like go out and play gigs and stuff. <laughs> he goes, I can do everything I ever could do. Just take a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear that girl blush on the radio. I mean, like, <laughs> if I quit telling this story, I'm, gonna, I'm saving that line because <laughs> that's a good line. <laughs> but Honey Boy uh, played uh, Sweet Home Chicago. And he played it in standard tuning with slide like this. Now what's cool about this is Honey Boy, well, I'll, I'll play it the way John Lee Hooker would have opened this tune. John Lee Hooker opened it like this. <laughs> Forgot I was a drop D. <laughs> something wrong with that. Okay, count with me. One, two, three. It's a crooked tune. That's how John Lee Hooker played. Honey Boy backed it out and realized that he was going to have to be in the middle of the shuffle when he hit the bottom. And he does this. I don't know how he did it. I mean, I frankly, I don't just. But he was a really good cat. And funny.
all in a fix, I'm crying. Hey, yeah. interviewed by Mac McCormick who there's a, a book out that you know a, that, that just came out of Mac's work he was a I'm not talking out of school he was a manic depressive and a bit crazy at the end of his life he wrote three or four versions of this book and we're not really sure which one is true <laughs> um, but he interviewed people all over the south in the, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s looking for Robert and stories about him and um, it's an interesting read but Mac interviewed the guy who poisoned him with well, the promise that they wouldn't publish anything until after everybody was dead. And Mac is now dead and everybody else dead too, but um, Robert apparently was hired one, one weekend to, to play a juke joint near Greenwood, Mississippi, um, and uh, which is near Avalon where John Hurt was from. And, and uh, he played that weekend and uh, the owner of the juke's wife got sweet on Robert and followed him in, back into town for two nights. Uh, Sunday, Saturday and Sunday night, and then came home to her husband, and her husband offered Robert the gig the next weekend, and fool that he was, he took it. And the guy, I don't think he meant to kill him, but he just wanted to fuck him up a little bit, you know, and so they, they put poison, probably strychnine, which was a common rat poison, available, widely available in the Delta at the time, in, um, in whiskey, and, and handed it to him. Now, there's a sunny boy, Edwards, tells a story like he was there, which he wasn't. Uh, so anyway, Williamson, sorry. Um, um, and he said that, that he, uh, that Robert went to take a drink of, of a bottle of whiskey and, and, and Son of Boy noticed that, th that it didn't have a seal on it. It wasn't, you know, sealed. And he knocked the bottle out of Robert's hand in, in an attempt to save him. Because don't, you know, you don't know what's in that. You, you know, you crack the seal, you drink it. Don't, don't let somebody hand you a drink. And Robert said, don't you ever knock a, a, a glass of whiskey out of my hand again, and, was, and poisoned himself later that night. This is not true, because there was no bonded whiskey in Mississippi. <laughs> um, you had to go to Arkansas and get moonshine, or somewhere out in the hills, but there, you, there was no story. It was a dry state, so that was like total nonsense. So again, there, the stories about Robert go on and on and on. 95% of them are false, um, but they make good, you know, it's good telling. And know? how old was Robert? Robert was 27 when he died. Wow. And he had two sets of recording sessions in 1935 and 1936. He was born in 1911, so he was 25 and 20, 24 and 25 years old when he recorded this music. I mean, shockingly facile guitar player. Um, and he got he, he was he was sickened, and they carried him into town, into into the neighborhood where Morgan Freeman was one year old. <laughs> 
<laughs> on the black side of the tracks. And um, and Robert lingered for about uh, 10 days to two weeks and then died and they buried him. He's buried in three places with eyewitnesses in each. <laughs> song he recorded teaches us where part of Robert's guitar cup style came from because he was listening to the Whorehouse piano players who recorded in the early 1930s out of St. Louis. And those guys, you hear this, jing, ba, 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 jing, ba, ba, jing, ba, lockdowns, turnarounds, things that were common in piano blues, but Charlie Patton didn't play them, Sunhouse didn't play them, Willie Brown didn't play them, Robert played them. And Johnny Shens started traveling with Robert to learn what Robert was doing. Because he said Robert was doing things nobody else was doing. He was doing walk downs and turnarounds. A walk down is. And a turnaround is. And that comes from piano blues. The guitar players in the Delta were not doing that until Robert started doing it. So he codified piano cliches and brought them into. Now it's like, that's how you play. But before Robert, it was not. And you could hear the difference. Until he was 16, every single bit of this music he would have heard would have been played by somebody in front of him as I'm playing for you. And at 16, in 1927, electronic microphones were invented, and he was hearing music from all over the damn place. He was the first modern blues man where records were part of his oral history. But he also had one foot in the old world. He had one foot with sun, with the old heads. And so he's a, he straddles the the line of demarcation between the early guys and us. You know, very ambitious cat. Yeah. But listen to this. First song you recorded.
on a living Cause I just ain't satisfied record I made. People don't buy records anymore, so I've, I've not been inspired to go out and make them because it, I have a basement full of CDs that nobody's going to ever listen to. Um, but there are some here tonight, and if you want them, take them. <laughs> if you want to make a donation, make a donation. But the, trying to sell them now is absurd because everything's available for free. So if you'd like to take some home, take a record. It's all right. Um, Speaking of donations, if any, don't forget to drop some things here. During the, during the pandemic, uh, you know, uh, I was happy I wasn't a line cooker or waiter. Those guys were screwed, but I, I could get online. And what it gave us was a chance to work remotely and to continue to play and to teach with a computer between us and the people we cared about. Thank God I can be here with you in this room tonight. <laughs> people, people, before <laughs> I started a Patreon page to get me through, which has been good. I've got 150 members, and the way I use Patreon, it's, it's a way you can have patrons for the arts. You know, it's like it's like Mozart, uh, but in the 21st century. And uh, if you like this work, you can tithe. You know, just make a little subscription. It's and uh, the way Patreon is marketed is if you tithe, you know, this amount, then you get this. But if you buy tithe this amount, oh, then you get this. You know, this amount, oh, then we we'll get you know. This is all the market, and I, I looked at it five years ago, long before the pandemic hit, and I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want that kind of transactional thing. I don't want the rich people to get the cool stuff, and the poor people to get that much. <laughs> so I just didn't even look, but the pandemic forced me into it, so I'm burrowing down it, grinding my teeth, swearing about a capitalist tool for artists. <laughs> There's people get the cool stuff, everybody else gets screwed. <laughs> and then I realized that I could assign privileges to all the different tiers of membership. So I just gave everybody everything. <laughs> so five bucks gets you in, five bucks a month, and you have access to the same amount as somebody who's paying 50 bucks a month. And the only reason to pay more is to buy a place at the table for the kid who can only afford five. And who wants to learn to play guitar during the pandemic. Yeah. So it's a flat you know, community, so I did that. And in October I decided, I have 150 members, I've been doing a lot of writing for them, but only 150 people see it, so I decided to put writing up on Substack, which is a blog platform, starting in November, um, sort of once a week. I call it Blues Notes, and it's there. It's free. It's all archived right now for 52 weeks of piece of cards here. Take one with you if you're interested at all. And you can find Patreon there, and you'll, you go to my site, you'll find Substack too. So um, it's, a, it's a way of staying alive. But also, you know, this has been a pretty interesting life. We've, We've lived well, um, and civilians have no idea, really, what this is like. And it's, it's incumbent on us to share it with them, especially to some teenage kid who goes like, well, I won't do that. <laughs> but it doesn't look possible. It didn't look possible to me when I was a teenager either, but here I am. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Um, yeah, I was. Uh, our, uh, our dear friend Lisa, who lives in, in our old cabin, has spent a lot of time. Is it is there now? And uh, I think you guys would have a lot of time. Yeah, I'm sure we would. And uh, a place. I, I also write songs, but you know, I, I like to I like to play the old stuff. I like. There's never enough time, so I'm going to play a couple of new songs for you before we go. Um, this one I wrote in 2009. Called a new song, but or eight. And uh, in 2007, uh, a woman named Gracia Cruz in the middle of June was lost in the Sonoran Desert on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. Um, the human smugglers had told everybody that, you know, it's a five mile walk to Tucson when it's 75 miles. And um, in the summer, it takes two gallons of water a day to stay alive, and it's about a five day or six day walk. So the many across, nobody can carry that much water, so the many across the border, your life's at risk. If anything goes wrong, if you, if you prick your finger on a, on a cactus, if you, if you sprain your ankle, if your shoe bottom falls off, you're going to die. 
And Gracia was lost in that desert, and I, I, I knew that the NAFTA treaty had made American corn, corporate corn, the most heavily subsidized crop in the country, if not the world, cheaper to sell in Mexico than it was to grow, and hundreds of thousands of, of Mexican farmers were thrown off land that they had successfully farmed for 150 years. And they headed north. So people don't realize America's complicity in this problem. But I wrote this song for Gracia, and then I played it for Latino musicians, Jose Cuellar and Tomas Montoya from Common Ground. And I played it at a festival. I sat them down individually, not together. I, went, I said, look, I'm kind of writing, and, and I'm kind of telling your story, and you've got to tell me if I got this wrong. Because we all have biases. They're called unconscious biases because we're not conscious of them. <laughs> so I wanted to drive this past Jose and Tomas and see if it was okay. And they said... This is a, thanks for writing this. This is a big deal. And I said, well, wanna, will you guys play on it? And they said, sure. It took me five years to get to the West Coast with enough time to book a studio and get those guys to play. And I called them, I arranged it, and they came to the studio, and we met there, and they, they're on the track. It's on YouTube now. It hasn't been, been released on any of my records. But um, Tomas said, you know, we, we, I know you said that you want us to play on it, but this has been a long time. We figured you must have recorded this. This, this. this has already went past. I said, I didn't want to do it without you. Hmm. You know, some white guy singing about this is, we need to do this together, right? So you'll hear them on YouTube, but tonight, they couldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> but this is her story, Gracia Cruz. In the town I was born It's full of cheap clothes from China And American corn But we have a small farm That we water with tears how can we compete? The gringo farms are so big Now we cannot stay here And why would I leave The land that I love Consuela, Rosalita, Mama y Papa My grandfather's bones are up on the hill If it weren't for Luigi's I'd be living there still So we pay the coyote We rode in the van We walked in the desert Lost in this land Her feet were so blistered that she could not go on When I left her I kissed her When I came back she was gone And why did we leave the land that we love Consuela, Rosalita, Mama y Papa My grandfather's bones are up on the hill If it weren't for low wages, I'd be living there still Who cares if your markets are free Look what you've done to my wife and me if your markets are free
for man who suffered and died a crown of thorns spear in his side he said father forgive them they don't know what they do but I'm sorry my friends when we come to the end how can we say that of you and why would we leave the land that we love on Suela Rosalita Papa y Papa my grandfather's bones are up on the hill if it weren't for the wages I'd be living there still who cares if your markets are free look what you've done to my wife and me who cares if your markets are set time but I'm gonna play two more songs for you oh, right. um, and uh, they're both original songs that uh, one of them's been recorded it's on Thunder's Mouth on the red record over here um, and I wrote it in June of 2005 and I played it first at Common Ground at this music festival in Maryland where uh, some of these people and I have spent time and and the song went over very well um, it was on July 4th was the festival and, and first performance and, and uh, six weeks later uh, is a song about a lost love song. I said it in New Orleans, kind of an R&B kind of pocket, very evocative, sexy kind of landscape, right? But at the end of August, uh, six weeks later, Katrina rolled through and destroyed the place. And without changing a word, this became a song not about losing somebody. But about losing a city, and of course we've had unimaginable natural catastrophes since then. Katrina, of course, wasn't a natural catastrophe. Um, the Clinton administration had passed funding to repair the levees in New Orleans, and the Bush administration wouldn't release the funds. Mm -hmm. So the next, so this was the political assassination of a black city, a black democratic city, by a venal Republican president. They call it the Federal Flood in New Orleans. But this song changed meaning when that happened. So this is for them and the, and the other folks who've lost stuff, right? Find yourself. 
myself someplace else to shine. I gotta get out of here. There's beer bottles and broken Mardi Gras beans laying up between parked cars. Got me a cold morning here in New Orleans. No good idea where you are. Oh, it's gonna rain. We're gonna the cypress trees where the cottonwoods whisper in the evening breeze I know you've gone I know we've changed but I still get this feeling when I can smell the rain I never come down here to bourbon the street nobody in this crowd that I care to meet but I'll have a one little whiskey sacred place to, to have an hour and, a, and, and 20 minutes of your attention that's irreplaceable I mean you're not going to get that time back <laughs> um, and so my job is to try and make it worthwhile you know and uh, anyway so this is a this is a song to close and uh, we'll uh, strike the gear and, and continue the party happy birthday Joe and I since it's the last tune I just want to say how grateful we are to have you here and to be able to have all you folks here to enjoy our company. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's amazing how much I've missed these people <laughs> for 30, know it. three decades. <laughs> you know, when I say all like, oh, God. <laughs> it's like there's no water been gone under the bridge, you know, we're just still right, right here. I'll play some fiddle later, I hope. <laughs> I love a darkened room. I love the empty stage where I lay my burdens down. I prepare to play And when the lights go dark Crowds all drift away When we pass 
part to serve. From friends we made along the way. This is where we come together. End of the day, how I love a darkened room, how I love the empty stage. Oh, wow. 